Welcome again to our online Bible study from Pine Valley Church of Christ. We began this past Sunday a study or look at the kingdom of God and what that means to us, how we need to be viewing that and seeing it in our lives and the role that we play in that. As you know, Jesus begins his uh, sample prayer in Matthew 7 with, after telling, you know, saying, you know, to God, we honor your name. You deserve that. And our desire is that his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so the coming of the kingdom is not something that's in the future. Uh, what he is desiring for people to live is not future only in heaven. It is about bringing that kingdom into this world. And it's very unique place in the plan of God uh, to reach out uh, to the whole world and bring them into a relationship, a kingdom covenant relationship with him. And so this first lesson is sort of going to introduce the whole thing to us, uh, serve as some uh, background material uh, for the rest of the lessons. Uh, but let me get up our screen share. And, you know, it's interesting, we spoke this past Sunday about, you know, we were celebrating on Monday, the 4th of July, uh, a celebration of our freedom, our independence, uh, which we fought for uh, from the British uh, monarchy uh, because of a feeling of not having any representation, no voice in any decisions that were being made. And that has sort of been the foundation of uh, our democracy for all these years is that uh, it is the will of the people uh, that come and uh, decide together what is best. But imagine if all of a sudden those who are in power said, well, we're giving up the presidency. We're going back to a monarchy. And we are going to appoint one man or his family to be uh, the kings of uh, these United States uh, from here. Uh, forever. Uh, they are in control. And you can just imagine the backlash that would come from that and the type of uh, vitriol and even revolution that that could spring. Because we are so used to having our, our individual rights and being able to say what we want to say and do what we want to do. And yet the kingdom of God uh, actually calls us to do the opposite thing. It actually calls us to voluntarily give up our wants and desires and give into the will of the Father who is in heaven, who is king over his kingdom that he has brought into this world. So we want to look at, uh, first of all, uh, the vision of the King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2 plays an important role in the uh, look at this kingdom concept and what God is doing and planning through all of this time. And so as we start this uh, study, you know, what we're calling kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, uh, we go back to that dream, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has taken Daniel and others uh, who were uh, deemed wise and young and smart uh, off into the Babylonian kingdom very early on. He has been there now a couple of years. Uh, Daniel has shown himself to be uh, very wise in terms of being able to interpret dreams. And this becomes a major uh, part in uh, the story. As so we come to uh, chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has had a horrible dream, something that has caused him to be afraid, create dread in his life. And he calls on his wise men to tell him the meaning of the dream, but uh, being a wise individual, uh, knowing that if he tells them the dream, then they can go back and sort of huddle together and come up with an interpretation. 
uh, he says, the only way I know that you actually know the meaning of this dream is that you have to tell me the dream. And they tell him several times, we just can't do that. You need to tell us the dream. And so they finally uh, just say, we can't do this. Um, verse 10 of chapter two, there is not a man on earth who can do what the king asked. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asked is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. And that's an image that plays against uh, the God of Daniel and him speaking through his servant, Daniel. And so he, uh, after hearing that the king has blown his stack, he is ready to kill all the wise men in the kingdom. Uh, Daniel hears about it. He goes to the king and asks for some time uh, to learn the dream and the interpretation. And he is given some time. He goes to his friends, asks them to pray for him. And in the night, he, the dream and its meaning are revealed to him. And so he goes uh, to the king uh, and king asked him, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? And in contrast to the wise men of Babylon, here is Daniel's reply in verse 27. No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. And then he tells him the details of the dream of this giant statue that Nebuchadnezzar sees, a head of gold, a chest and arms of silver, uh, stomach, thighs of bronze and legs of iron and the feet that are iron mixed with clay. And he says, God has revealed to you the things that are going to come in the future years. And he begins to share with him uh, that Nebuchadnezzar Babylon is the head of gold. There's going to come another one, which is, uh, if you read through the whole book, all of the four kingdoms are specifically uh, mentioned or identified in later chapters. But then the Persians are going to come, and then the Greeks were going to come, and then the Romans, which would be like iron in terms of their military strength and able to smash anything around them. Uh, yet they would be a somewhat divided kingdom uh, because of the way in which they treated the people. And just quickly to mention this, uh, some today in their dispensationalist view of things uh, try to make uh, the feet of iron and clay a fifth kingdom rather than there just being four. Uh, Daniel makes it very plain in his discussion with Nebuchadnezzar that there are only four. And the final one is uh, like iron in the way in which it is power, uh, but it is a very divided kingdom. And this is a characteristic of the fourth kingdom. It is not a mention of a fifth kingdom. And that's important for us to understand. And my best illustration that I can give you is in their day and time, Rome was the economic and military power of the world. Uh, but they were very divided because of the way in which they treated the people which they conquered and the uh, prejudice and hatred and all the things that went on. Uh, we compare that to America today. We take great pride in that we are the number one economy in the world and we are the great superpower in the world. And yet we are extremely divided country uh, filled with hate and discord and uh, makes us, from that standpoint, uh, something that is very brittle. And that's what's being described by those uh, feet of iron and clay. And so it is during the time of that last kingdom, uh, which each of the metals, as you move on, uh, is less value than the one before, but they get harder and um, more destructive. And that is the iron. Uh, all of these kingdoms have tried 
uh, their best to conquer the world around them. Uh, but it is during the time of those fourth kingdom, he says, that there is a stone that is not cut by human hands, which comes from smashing into history and ends up destroying all of those kingdoms, uh, but itself is eternal and grows throughout the entire earth. And it is this concept of these metals, which even though they get lose value and get harder, uh, you know, just a basic rock doesn't seem to have much value, but it is something that can smash into history because it is from God, not from humans. And this is his kingdom, Daniel says, that God will bring into this world, uh, which is the only one that is going to cover the entire earth, uh, which all the others would like to do, is conquer the entire earth. And it is the only one that will last forever. And in contrast, especially to those uh, the feet of iron and clay of the Romans, uh, it is the only one that will unify uh, people from wherever they come from, rather than dividing them as happened in the Roman Empire. And so this is the picture uh, that God gives to Nebuchadnezzar and to us through his prophet Daniel and it is um, explained in more detail as you go through the book. And we'll be looking at some of those things in the weeks to come. But I just want us to get this big picture. And this is important for us to think about uh, even today, because uh, I know as a young man growing up, I heard people uh, in church say, well, you know, you know the Lord's Prayer was a you know, it's a great example prayer, but we shouldn't be just reciting it today because especially the first part, because we're praying for the kingdom to come and it has come. And then you usually are referring specifically to the church. Uh, but that's not the point of the prayer. It's point is that we are seeking the coming of the kingdom and the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it has arrived, which we'll look at in a minute, but it is not yet complete or brought to its ultimate fulfillment. And so as we look at these things, there's some things we need uh, sort of talk about in terms of the way pe which people uh, look at uh, the life and ministry of Jesus in particular, as he is the one who comes proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of God is arriving it is at hand and uh, other traditions in christianity they have their creeds that talk about the importance of affirming the virgin birth of jesus and they jump immediately to the death burial and resurrection of jesus and sort of skip everything in between uh, we have a habit of sort of skimming through the gospels emphasizing again the death burial and resurrection and, but we want to get to Acts and letters of Paul because we want, we want to get, that tells us how to do church. And that's what we want to focus on. And so we have to sort of step back and look at what is really the life and the ministry and the teaching really all about and what's it trying to share with us and teach us in context of this coming kingdom uh, that God wants uh, to bring through his son Jesus and through his followers on earth as it is in heaven. So there's several different ways in which people tend to focus. And all of them have truth in them, but they simply are incomplete. The first one is that, that you know, Jesus is trying to teach us how to go to heaven. Uh, that's what it's all about. And yet in the Jewish context, when people, he's talking about, uh, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven if you do this or if you don't do this. Uh, he's talking about something that is much more uh, tangible and immediate uh, than just going to heaven. It is uh, something that you know, we have to understand that the kingdom of heaven is not about people going to heaven. It's about the rule of heaven coming to earth. So yes, ultimately, uh, I, the goal that is out there for us is that we go to heaven, but 
between now and then. It is about us uh, being a part of bringing the rule of heaven to earth and so that the will of God can be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, some just look at it as uh, teaching and it's ethical teaching of how to behave, uh, which can just sort of relegate Jesus to being an ethical teacher to like uh, Buddha or Muhammad or any others throughout history, uh, rather than seeing him as God in the flesh, uh, trying to teach us about kingdom behavior and how this is going to change and shape the world around us as it is an active thing uh, living in the world rather than just being sort of a benign, uh, kind uh, lifestyle uh, in the world today. So again, there's some truth there, but it is not complete. Uh, others like to look at it as, oh, well, you know, the, the Bible, the New Testament, especially the Gospels, give us characters we can identify with. Uh, we can identify with uh, the stubbornness of Peter and always sticking his foot in his mouth. We can identify uh, with James and John who are ready to call down uh, fire from heaven on a town that won't listen to them or uh, to doubting Thomas or to Nicodemus who just wants to get a glimpse of this Jesus that he's heard about. You know, these are great characters and we can identify with them and learn the lessons from them. But it's not just about picking out uh, individuals or individual events in their lives uh, that we have to look at. We have to look at where were those Jesus taking those characters? What was the destination in their life? Uh, and even Jesus himself, besides teaching how to behave, he's often just looked at as, well, he is showing us the way to live or how to live our life. But this can become overwhelming and it can be uh, something that uh, causes us to doubt and struggle with because it's very easy to see that we're not perfect, Jesus, and to uh, say that, you know, we're being called to live exactly like him uh, then becomes a futile thing if we're not seeing it within the context of being part of the kingdom and what he is trying to share with us. Uh, the book of Hebrews and other places talk about Jesus being the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God. Uh, the Gospel of John uh, quotes John the Baptist as referring to him. Uh, and he is that. But before he is the sacrifice, he was the bringer of the kingdom, and it is the perfect sacrifice that brings the kingdom. And we must see the connection between all that. Again, there's truth, but it's not complete. And we also tend to focus on it showing us that Jesus is divine. He was uh, God in the flesh. All of these are trying to share with us uh, who Jesus is or what his ministry is about, uh, but tend to fall short, even in his divinity. It's not whether he is God, but what God is doing in and through him uh, as a part of bringing about his kingdom. And so that's how we want to approach this in weeks to come, uh, truly looking at uh, the life and ministry of Jesus uh, as it fulfills uh, the work of God through Israel, as it brings about the new kingdom, uh, a kingdom that is continuing to grow and spread throughout the world, uh, and a kingdom that is eternal, whether it's here on earth or whether it will be later in the new heaven and the new earth uh, with God for all eternity. So let's Let's look at that picture real quick. Uh, where, where are we? The Bible begins with the beautiful picture in uh, Genesis 1 and 2 of God creating a true paradise. It is a masterpiece. Uh, when he is done, even with the creation of uh, man and woman, uh, he says everything is very good. It's a wonderful place. Everything is there for humans to live and to thrive. 
And yet very quickly it turns into open rebellion, whether it is in the garden and the suggestions of uh, the serpent, which caused them to want to be like a God. And then rejection from that paradise, from the Garden of Eden, to Cain killing his own brother, uh, to years later before the flood, uh, we are told that everything, everybody is evil, all thoughts, all the time, are just evil, and God is grieved that he has made mankind. And even after there's the cleansing and he starts over with the one family, the one man uh, who is righteous before him, which is Noah, uh, the rebellion continues, uh, especially as uh, the example of the Tower of Babel where people uh, openly defy his command to spread throughout the world and they decide to uh, stay where they want to be and make a name for themselves. So God says, I'm still going to bring my kingdom and I'm going to bring people back to my kingdom, but I'm going to start with this one man and his family. And the promise is made to Abram. And he leaves his family and goes to the promised land. He goes wherever God wants him to. Uh, eventually his one son becomes uh, two sons, become 12 sons that become, by the time they go to Egypt, uh, in the time of Joseph, there are 70 in the family. And by the end of the exit, or the time of their uh, 450 years in Egypt, now there are several million of them, uh, but they have been oppressed. And God calls them out of their oppression and their uh, slavery in Egypt. And when he brings them to Mount Sinai in the desert, he tells them, beginning in verse uh, Exodus 19, verse 5 and following. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possessions. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites as he's talking to Moses. They were to be a kingdom of people. They were to show the people around them what it was to be the people of God and what the, it means for a nation or a kingdom to live under God's rule. Unfortunately, they failed miserably uh, through the years. And they even uh, reject God as king. As we see after the period of the judges, uh, Samuel has been leading the people. And toward the end of his life, we see in 1 Samuel 8, the people come to him and ask uh, him to appoint a king for them uh, so they it can be like the other nations. So you're getting old. Uh, you're about to die. We don't trust your kids uh, to rule over us. So appoint for us a king. And Samuel is uh, very upset by this. And he goes to God and prays. And we're told in 1 Samuel 8, verse 7, the Lord said to him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt till this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Again, just more rejection, even from this covenant people, the descendants of uh, Abraham, but God has made a promise and he has made a pledge and a plan and he is going to fulfill those things. And even though he tells him, go ahead, uh, appoint a king and we'll show them uh, the burdens that human kings can be on them. Uh, but it is after, uh, during the life of David over in 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, as he has been identified as a man after God's own heart and he becomes king after the death of Saul uh, that God comes to him and promises him uh, that he will uh, always have a descendant on the throne and that throne will be established forever in 2 Samuel 7 verse 16 and 
it is part of, even though when the people are uh, misbehaving, they're rebelling, God makes sure that the line of David is kept intact. And as we are introduced uh, to in the opening verses of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, we are told that Joseph is a descendant of David, who is a descendant of Abraham. And this is the man who marries Mary, the virgin, uh, who is the mother of Jesus by way of the Holy Spirit. God fulfills his purpose, his plan, his promise that he was going to bring back, uh, going to bring his eternal kingdom into the world, which it does come smashing in, in the form of Jesus and his life and ministry, just not in human ways, but in divine ways. And ultimately through his death, burial, and resurrection, the eternal kingdom is uh, established. Uh, Jesus is raised as king, and he now sits at the right hand of God in heaven. And he truly is presented as the king and his kingdom, that which he had been proclaiming since the very beginning of his ministry. And again, we're going to be going through so many of these things in the weeks to come and helping see the connection between them all and looking at it in a fuller sense. But he, he wants them to know, and Paul mentions this several, several times throughout his letters, uh, that the kingdom has been established. It's here. It has arrived, but it is also yet to come. It is still to be completely fulfilled. And we are still in that process. We are in the last days. We don't know how long they will last, but we are in that last period of history where the king has been established and his kingdom has been established. But we are still in that kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven so that more will come to his kingdom from all over the earth and be part of that which is uh, special and divine as brought about by God himself. This is something Jesus wanted his disciples to understand after uh, Peter confesses that he believes that they, he is the Christ. And he tells them that you know, what's going to happen to him in Jerusalem and that they too have to deny self. Uh, this isn't about uh, you speaking your mind, uh, you getting your own rights. This is about denying self and taking up your cross. But he says specifically to that group, I tell you, some of you are standing here, will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, that is not a statement about something that's going to happen thousands of years from now. He's not uh, projecting this out. He's talking to this specific group of people uh, who would see uh, the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, uh, which they do when they witness his resurrection, and then they are there when the kingdom comes in power through the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Jesus says to them, after his resurrection, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, not in the future, but now. And it's all authority in heaven and on earth. Not everybody on earth has accepted it, uh, most still reject it and fight. They, in fact, they fight against it. But Jesus says, no, I am now the king. This is my kingdom, in which we are, you are to go out now because of this, go into all the world and make disciples of Jesus, bringing them into his kingdom, uh, help become workers uh, to uh, bring the will and kingdom of God uh, to earth as it is in heaven. This is the culmination of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, when he tells them that the patriarch David died and was buried in his tomb and is here today. Uh, but he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah uh, that he is not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we're all witnesses of it. Exalted 
to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said that the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Which is a quote from Psalm 110, verse 1, a Psalm of David. Therefore, he says, here is the clincher. Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And it is to that conclusion, that reality, that then they say, what do we need to do? To which the response is, you need to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But that is based on the fact that God has made this Jesus Lord and Messiah. He is king. He has brought the kingship back to God himself, which the people had rejected in the days of Samuel, but now has been fulfilled and will continue on for all eternity. It is a magnificent uh, story and pledge and a promise that God has fulfilled. So much a part of uh, what God, Jesus, I believe, wants us to be praying. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so in the weeks to come, we will be talking about this together. How do we uh, respond to the fact that our Lord and Savior is Lord and Master? He is the Messiah. He is the King. And it doesn't mean uh, that we... Uh, what we focus on and what our rights are and what we want as is so common in our world and in our country, but rather on the will of our King whom we have come before and we bow down to and give our lives to on a daily basis. So that will be our focus in the weeks to come. Uh, our next lesson is going to focus on uh, how uh, Israel is a part of all this plan and how Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel and what God was trying to do uh, through them in this world as he was bringing about his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, as was described in that vision uh, to Nebuchadnezzar uh, 2,500 years ago. So that's where we'll be going uh, this next week. and We will continue on together. Uh, finding its fulfillment in the cross and how that connects, but then what it means to our lives uh, in very practical ways as we seek to be disciples of the King. So thank you for joining us in this study. Uh, we look forward to our time together in the weeks to come, and we will uh, see you next week. Please join us again. Between now and then, may God bless you and keep you safe and healthy. And may his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven.